Well, good morning. I have not received an introduction like that before, so that's a first. Hey, I want to welcome those of you joining online today. Great to have you with us. Uh, if you're joining by uh, another venue or radio, great to have you as well. Um, uh, before we get to our sermon for the day, uh, I just have some family business, so if you're a guest with us, just hold tight. Um, but for those of you who call Ward Church home, you're a member of Ward Church, we are going to have a congregational meeting on Sunday, February 25th at 12.10 or right after the 11 o'clock services end in the sanctuary. Um, and what's coming to you is a vote proposed by law change regarding our nomination process for candidates for our annual meeting. And so this comes to you as a unanimous recommendation from your session or elders uh, for you to vote on as a congregation. So if uh, you're a member, we'd love for you to be there. Uh, there's an FAQ, a Frequently Asked Questions sheet uh, at the info desk if you want to grab one of those to find out more information about what the change actually is. Or you can go uh, on the website. Uh, we have a link for you there uh, if you want to find out more information. But if you are a member of Ward Church, strongly encourage you to be there, to be a part of this uh, recommendation brought to you by your elders uh, for your vote. So if you are new with us today, uh, one, great to have you with us. I'm really excited you're here. Uh, we uh, began this new year with a vision for 2018. Scott kind of rolled out uh, that we want to look up this year, we want to look in, and we want to look out. And as we kind of kick off this year, we're, we're looking up, and we said, what better place than going to God's Word as the foundation for our lives to find out who God truly is. And so we're in a series called Rooted, and we're kind of finishing that up uh, today. And I'd like to talk to you for the next couple minutes about a better way to live. A better way to live. And I have a couple points to help guide our time together. Uh, the first is a warning. Uh, the second is getting your chair kicked at 35,000 feet. And the last one, and most importantly, spitting out your vegetables in the toilet. <laughs> Those points will make sense as we make our way through. I heard a story one time about a man named Lee Caps. He had never flown on an airplane before. And he was going up with his friend who was a pilot in his, his private plane, this, this pilot. And so they take off together. They reach cruising altitude. And about that time, Lee's friend, the pilot, had a massive heart attack and died right there. Now, Lee, during this brief introduction to flying, saw his friend grab this radio to call somebody. And so at that moment, Lee grabs that radio and he starts yelling in this radio, help, help, help. And on the other end, this air traffic controller in a calm voice said, uh, hello, sir. Um, I have some good news for you today. I am not only an air traffic controller, but I'm also a flight instructor. Would you like me to teach you how to land this plane? <laughs> Lee, of course, says, y yes, yeah, yes. So he walked him through the basics, how to maneuver, how to land the plane. And then this flight instructor had these very important words where he changed his calm voice to a very serious tone. He says, now, Mr. Caps, this is going to be very important. This is the most important lesson you will ever receive in your whole life because you must now apply everything you have just been taught if you want to land this plane. This is your only hope. Bystanders who were there watching this plane come in said it was not pretty. Some referred to this landing, it looked like a drunken goose. But Lee landed the plane and walked out alive. The words of this flight instructor, again, were, you must apply everything you just learned to land this plane. You see, it wasn't helpful for Lee to know all this information. He had to put it to work if he was going to come out alive. James gives us a similar warning in his book in the New Testament it says these words do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says 
What, what does it mean to you for someone to be a wise person? This question has been asked by the smartest minds for centuries. What does it mean to be a wise person? Uh, this coming week, our president will give a State of the Union address. But there was a man named Jesus who gave a State of the Universe address about 2,000 years ago. And on a mountaintop, before a crowd of people, he gave a sermon. He spoke words to them about a better way to live. And as he closed this sermon, his parting words were this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Jesus says, be careful that you live by these words of mine. Not that you just know them, but are they transforming your life? Are you becoming a more loving person? In the last five years, have you become a more generous, gentle, and forgiving person? Do you find yourself giving into complaining and arguing? Do you find yourself giving into the gossip? Jesus says, there is a life that I have for you where joy is available despite the circumstances that you face if you will choose to live by these words I have given you. Last year, I experienced something that I haven't experienced in quite a long time. It's a very rare occasion for me now. I actually boarded an airline flight by myself. Usually, I'm traveling with three small kids. And if you have ever boarded a plane and you've seen that young family get on, please do not look at them with scorn but pray for them. Even if they are smiling on their face, what they are really doing is they are hanging on by a thread inside. But I boarded this plane and I took my seat and it was this rare occasion of flying solo. And I was really excited for a relaxing flight. I brought a book that I was ready to read. But you know where this story is going. In God's sovereignty, he put a five-year-old right behind me who for sport wanted to see how hard he could truly kick my chair. <laughs> and so after five minutes, I let it go, hoping that his mother sitting next to him would step in. She did not. And so I did what any reasonable person did. I turned around and I popped him. <laughs> That's not true but that is what I felt. <laughs> so I turned around and I bent down right in front of him and I said, hey buddy, <laughs> could, could you stop kicking my chair? Saying it loud enough, hoping his mother sitting next to him would hear. And this little boy looked back at me with a face that said everything. As I had finished saying this, his face communicated to me, Mr., I do not care about one word coming out of your mouth. <laughs> his mother steps in at this point saying, you need to obey, you need to stop doing this. But about five minutes later, the kicks only grew stronger and existed for most of the flight. Now, I have been in this same situation, having a kid on my lap, trying to stop them from kicking the chair in front of them because just like them, they found sport and how hard could I kick this chair? And me as a parent, trying to be as quick as I could to stop them, but they are just quick. Kids are fast. But what is interesting in this situation is while I have been in this same seat, uh, I could make the excuses that it's based on the circumstances that I was facing but how hard it was for me to offer this same 
situation to this mom. When I was in the situation, the person on the spot with the kid in the lap kicking the chair, it was the circumstances. I was trying my best. I just couldn't stop them. They're so fast. But this mom, it was very clear to me, there was no gray about it. She was just a bad mother. (laughs) And a bad person. (laughs) Isn't it amazing in our life how easy it is for us to make the excuses for ourselves? It's the circumstances we're in, it's the situation we face, but we can't extend that same grace to someone else facing that similar situation. James says it this way. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. James tells us that we can learn a lot about ourselves when we're getting our chair kicked at 35,000 feet. You see, when we step away from the mirror of God's word, our view becomes distorted, whether too positively or too negatively. If you're like me, when you step away from the mirror of God's word, you have an overinflated view of yourself. You make excuses for why things are, but you're quickly to blame anyone else. And on the other end, some of you, as you step away from the mirror of God's word, you take on an inferior view of yourself. Someone encourages you. Someone says a positive word to you, but you cannot receive it because of the shame and the guilt in your life. There's a negative story or script that you've allowed to speak over your life. And God says, listen, I've hold out to you a consistent mirror for you to get an accurate picture of who you are. And he gives it in two reminders. The first reminder from the mirror is that you are utterly loved. You are utterly loved. If you've allowed negativity to consume your life, if you've allowed insecurity to steal your joy, if you've allowed your past or a secret to define you, God holds out a profound reminder from the mirror this morning, you are utterly loved, more than you know. Not for what you do or for what you have done, but for who you are. At the core of your soul, you are utterly loved. Regardless of your past or your issues or whether you even believe in Jesus, God loves you with an overwhelming love. And he will pursue you till the end of time. The second reminder from the mirror is this. You are utterly powerless. You are utterly powerless. Last week, um, we were, I was sitting at our kitchen table and our son Lane was sitting on our counter And I was doing some emails, and he was just sitting there, and he yelled over at me. He said, hey, Daddy, what does Veek mean? Uh, Buddy, did did you say Beak? No, Veek. Little ones to him belong. They are Veek, but he (laughs) is strong. That song's trying to teach you something. You are utterly powerless. You and I have always been and will always be in need of God's grace and power for all eternity. One of my favorite hymns, maybe yours too, is Amazing Grace. And one of my favorite lines in that song is, "'Tis grace that brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home." And God used a four-year-old little boy 
to remind me this past week that we never outgrow the words of that song. You are weak, but he is strong. Maybe you're here this morning and you have been doing religion for so long that you have forgotten that you need Jesus. Maybe you're here, there's an addiction in your life that you have kept concealed and covered up, but the Spirit is telling you it's time to come clean. Maybe you're here, there's a situation in your life that feels out of control. You're trying your best by your own strength and power to get your hands around it, but however much you try, it continues to be out of your control. Would you hand over the chaos and the storms that you're facing to the only one who can calm the seas? Friends, I have good news. You are weak, but he is strong. Lastly, I want you to imagine a picture you're waking up, it's a little bit before eight o'clock in the morning. It's 70 degrees outside. That sounds really good right about now. Pure Michigan. You stagger to your kitchen, because that's all you can do when you haven't had caffeine. You get the coffee going, and as the aroma fills your nose, you're looking out the window to see the waves crashing on your beachfront property. The image is getting really good. I can, I can see it in your face. It's a little after 8 o'clock. You start to sip your coffee, take in the beautiful scenery, and you receive a text that says something like this. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. And if you don't know the story, earlier this month, people living in Hawaii experienced this same threat. But what we found out was, while they were running a drill, someone accidentally pressed the wrong button which is stop and pray for that person right now. <laughs> they had a bad day. And I don't mean to over-exaggerate this point, but I think that many people have been living with the same fear of God their entire lives. They've got an image of God in the Bible that has them living with a death con warn one warning over their life. When I was a kid, my dad had this really strict rule that if you wanted dessert, you had to eat everything on your plate. And he was adamant about this. So my brother and I developed several techniques for how we would pass the clean plate inspection. And one of them, actually the best technique, was you would fill your mouth as much as you could with all the vegetables you possibly could and discreetly make your way to the bathroom, to which point you would spit out all of those vegetables in the toilet. And then you would come back and sit down. This was the most efficient way because the napkin could only hold so much. You know, but after three times to the bathroom in about 10 minutes, you know, my dad began to pick up on this, what was happening. You know, for many of us, this is exactly how we feel many times. And I don't want to over-exaggerate this point, but I think there are many people in the church and many people who have rejected Jesus they need to hear a new message once again of what God truly wants for them out of life. See, James says this, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, 
they will be blessed in what they do. You see, many people have gotten confused that when they hear you need to obey the Bible, they think they need to do this to keep God happy. But this passage reminds us it's actually the opposite. The Bible was given to us to keep us happy. You see, this word here, blessed, means the ideal life, the happy life, the good life. You see, God is not out to keep the scores, and it's not about you keeping the vegetables down, but God is out for your good. And as this passage says, he's out for your freedom, for your freedom. God spoke to a prophet named Ezekiel, said, I have a message for you. I have my words to give you that you would pass on uh, to the people of Israel. And this is what it says. Then God said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Ezekiel is speaking metaphorically, of course, but he's saying, listen, these are not veggies you need to force down, but they are honey. Maybe you're here this morning and you would call yourself a Christian. Have you accepted a wrong view of God that leaves you just trying to keep God happy? You're tired, you're worn out, you're just longing to get up from the dinner table. Maybe you're here this morning and you would call yourself a skeptic. And I would humbly ask you, have you accepted a wrong view of God while all along this was not the God Jesus came to reveal? Whether you're a Christian today or a skeptic, Maybe today is a day for a fresh start. Maybe today is a day where you actually step into this happy life that God has always longed for you to experience. There's a philosopher named Dallas Willard, and Dallas said there are four questions that all humanity is seeking to answer, no matter who you are. Four, four questions that are unavoidable. And one of those questions is, what is the good life? What is the good life? He says, whether you're a follower of Jesus or a skeptic, everyone is trying to answer that question. What is the good life? Friends, receive the good life found in the sacred word. Let it flow through your veins. Let the story of redemption and grace found in Jesus grip your heart. And surrender with openness once again this morning, maybe for the first time, to the overwhelming love of God and allow it to change you from the inside out. Let's pray. Well, God, we receive your invitation once again and your kindness to us to step into the good life that you have for us through your word. That we would taste and see that you are good. Not veggies to force down, but honey to savor. We surrender our control to you this morning. We surrender our situations to you, knowing that you have called us to life with you, and that is the safest place we can be. We pray this all in the name of Jesus and in his grace this morning, and the church said together, amen, amen.